Look out, superheroes, here comes the big wheel. Marvel and DC have always had some sort of rivalry going on, whether it be who could have the best superhero team, who could rack up the biggest lawsuit, or what this video is concerned with, who could create the most bizarre, nightmarishly stupid supervillain of all time. 1941. Marvel creates Armless Tiger Man, an amputee who joins the Nazis after his arms were chopped off in a workplace accident. DC looks at this and goes, okay, how about Crazy Quilt, a painter who uses bright colours to hypnotise his enemies. Marvel fires back with Gorilla Man, a hunter who tries to kill a gorilla, and when he does, it turns him into a gorilla. Fair play, says DC. How about Animal Vegetable Mineral Man? <laughs> I think it's safe to say who wins here. But it's easy to take someone like Armless Tiger Man or Animal Vegetable Mineral Man and laugh at them. But back then, this was some serious stuff. Let's take Asbestos Lady, for example, an enemy of the original Human Torch. As her name might suggest, she built herself a suit lined head to toe with asbestos, and also had these special asbestos bullets. Now, if you're not familiar with asbestos, it was basically this material used all around the world in floors, roofs, insulation, and the great thing about it was is that it was fireproof, making someone like Asbestos Lady the perfect opponent for a man whose whole thing is fire. Now, because it was the 1940s, no one saw a problem with this. This wasn't ridiculous at the time. In her first appearance, she tries to drown the human torch with an asbestos-lined fishing net, but her plan fails and she goes to prison. And that was it. Marvel pretty much forgot about her for like half a century. She had a few fleeting cameos in the 70s and 80s, but it was only in 2005, almost 60 years after she was first introduced, that asbestos lady finally made her return. Now, she only appeared for less than a page, but in this page, it is heavily implied that Asbestos Lady, along with many other wacky supervillains at the time, was created and illegally funded by the US government to combat the threat that superheroes posed to their own personal agendas. And by now it was 2005, and so it was widespread knowledge that while asbestos is an efficient, fireproof material, it also causes cancer. Therefore, it was mentioned that at some point after the 1940s, Asbestos Lady had gotten cancer and died. Despite how stupid she was in hindsight, Asbestos Lady now serves as an actual unintentional metaphor for how real-world governments expose their employees to harmful substances. It's accidental genius. But, believe it or not, this was not Marvel's only Asbestos-themed supervillain. If it ain't broke, make another one. So along came Asbestos Man. It was the same deal as before. Someone with an asbestos suit tries to kill the Human Torch, gets defeated in the same issue, and is never mentioned again for the next 48 years. But unlike Asbestos Lady, whose death only got a brief mention, Asbestos Man was brought back to directly address the effects of asbestos. He now has to carry around an oxygen tank so that he doesn't die of asbestosis, but ironically enough, this helps him out. People are now actually scared of him, not because of his evil plan, but because they're scared of getting cancer. Asbestos Man tries to fight the Great Lakes Avengers, who are like the Z-list version of the Avengers, but ends up breaking down in the middle of the fight. He's embarrassed at how rubbish he is as a supervillain, and is scared that no one will remember him. Seeing as the Great Lakes Avengers are equally as lame, they make him a deal. They promise to remember him and spread the word about how great of a villain he was, so long as he surrenders himself. And so, Asbestos Man turns himself in, and passes away shortly after. Around the same time as Asbestos Lady, DC were also churning out their fair share of stupid villains. You had The Fiddler, Kite Man, Polka Dot Man, and one of my favourites, Angle Man, who was an enemy of Wonder Woman. So you have Wonder Woman, this near-invincible goddess, versus a normal man with a protractor. That's it, he just, <laughs> he, just, he just likes measuring things with his protractor, that's his whole thing. And you know what? He almost wins, like, multiple times. If the 1940s marked the birth of stupid villains, it was really the 60s where they got to shine. In fact, you could call it the golden age of dumb villains, and it was basically all Daredevil's fault. You see, while Spider-Man was fighting Doctor Octopus, and the Fantastic Four were fighting Doctor Doom, Daredevil had Stiltman, Leapfrog, and Pastepot Pete. Now, I've spoken about Pastepot Pete on this channel before, but he's definitely worth mentioning again. Peter Petruski was a scientist who created this special kind of paste, and so he used it to create a paste gun and commit petty crimes. Perhaps his most notable appearance is when he tried to fight Spider-Man, only for Spider-Man to break down laughing at his name. So much so that Spider-Man couldn't finish the fight because he just found it so hilarious. And, later on, when Pete tries to change his name, calling himself The Trapster, Spider-Man doesn't forget about it and makes fun of him anyway. 
Pete spent many, many years as the Trapster, but more recently he changed his name back to Pastebot Pete. This was so he could use his ridiculous reputation to his advantage, as everyone would be too busy laughing at him to actually stop him committing crimes. It's a nice little tale of self-acceptance and using your own flaws to your own benefit. DC, on the other hand, had the Clock King. If you look at this guy, maybe you're thinking, oh, someone who can slow down time or reverse it or something along those lines. Uh, no, he just likes clocks. <laughs> He will rob clock stores, businesses that have something to do with clocks in their name, banks, I guess banks have clocks in them. Eventually the Green Arrow manages to catch him and put him in jail. But when it comes to Clock King, there's more to it than meets the eye. Clock King's real name is William Talkman, who commits crimes in order to pay for his terminally ill sister's treatment. When he himself is diagnosed with six months to live, he dresses up in a clock costume, this being tragic symbolism for how he's running out of time. But when the Green Arrow stops him and he's stuck in jail, there's no one to help his sister, and so she dies alone. And to make things even worse, the doctor gave him the wrong diagnosis and he's actually fine, so this whole thing was for nothing. When he finally gets out of jail, he swears revenge on the Green Arrow, and confronts him on top of a clock tower. It's almost a triumphant plan, until at the last minute when he gets punched in the head and goes back to jail. This is quite a sad story, but it wasn't the first time-related bad guy that DC had put out. Just two years prior, DC came out with Calendar Man, a formidable Batman villain whose crimes would always have something to do with a specific date or season. Like most of these villains, he didn't actually have any powers, and he'd always get beaten up and go to jail in the same issue. That was until the entire DC universe was rebooted, don't worry about it, does that all the time, and Calendar Man was reimagined as an insane, brutal criminal whose obsession with calendars drove him mad, and he was institutionalised at Arkham Asylum. Upon seeing this, Marvel fired back with the living eraser. He erases people. Not to be confused with the eraser Nazi, but it was the 1970s when things were really taken to the next level, as it marked the creation of two of Spider-Man's most iconic villains. The Big Wheel and The Wall. The Big Wheel was a corrupt businessman driven to the brink of suicide after being blackmailed. Instead of offing himself, however, he commissioned a giant armoured hamster wheel to get revenge on everyone who'd done him wrong. This ended up with him accidentally rolling off a bridge and he was thought to have drowned, but his story doesn't end there. Turns out he survived the river and went to prison, and it was there he was entered into a reformation programme for supervillains. Having become a new man, he returned as the Big Wheel years later, to help Spider-Man fight crime. He's not exactly the best at it though, and fails to stop both Stiltman and the Shocker. Realising that he's not fit to be a superhero, Big Wheel chooses a different career path, performing at monster truck rallies where he finally gets the respect he so desperately desired. Much like Paddington 2, the Big Wheel takes a silly, childlike concept and uses it to advocate for prison reform amid a corrupt system. The Wall, on the other hand, was a high school student who was crushed by some bricks, which magically transformed him into a living brick wall. That's, uh, that's all there is to him. By now we're in the 80s, and while the number of wacky supervillains kind of slowed down, there were still some memorable ones, such as Slide, another Spider-Man villain who used non-stick cooking oil to slip around everywhere. There was also an X-Men villain called Ice Cream, whose power was that he could turn into any flavour of ice cream that he wanted, including Banana Split. But this was just the calm before the storm, also known as the 90s, which were a very dark time for comic books. Sales figures were dwindling, characters were getting edgy makeovers to make them look cool again, but that didn't mean there weren't any bullshit villains. I don't think I have to explain this, but oh well. When Codpiece was in high school, he was rejected by a girl who said he wasn't big enough. Now, what she meant was that he wasn't tall enough. However, he misinterpreted this statement and got to work building this. As stupid as this may be, it's actually pretty efficient. It shoots bullets, it's got a drill for breaking into bank vaults, and it's also got a retractable boxing glove. Unfortunately for Codpiece, he is confronted by the Doom Patrol and defeated in the worst way humanly possible. Codpiece does not hold a candle, however, to Dog Welder, who welds dead dogs onto people's faces, and when he runs out of dogs, he goes into an alleyway to kill some more. I know he's technically not a villain, but like, come on, that's pretty fucking evil. These villains are just plain ridiculous. You can take one look at them and see everything you need to know about them. But there are some villains that, while they may not look so ridiculous from the outside, they still have some really stupid motivations or evil plans. 
Take Sauron, for example. Not only did he just steal his name from the Lord of the Rings, but his evil plan is to turn everyone on Staten Island into dinosaurs by completely rewriting their DNA. However, as Spider-Man rightly points out, if he can rewrite DNA, he could easily cure cancer. To which Sauron famously responds, I don't want to cure cancer, I want to turn people into dinosaurs. One of my favourites is yet again another daredevil villain called the Matador. Now say what you want about his costume or his tragic backstory as a bullfighter, but you can't deny the sheer genius of his plan to defeat Daredevil. To cover him with a big cloth so that he can't see. But I think that every villain I've mentioned so far, all these ridiculous ideas, they all pale in comparison to one villain in particular. And this character wasn't created by Marvel or DC, instead he's in the public domain, so anyone is free to use him however they like. His name is Brickbat, first appearing in the 1942 issue of Police Comics. He was a nameless, faceless criminal who put on a Batman mask and killed people with bricks. He refused to explain his motivations or why he was dressed up as a bat and got killed in one punch before he could elaborate. He is truly the godfather of all ridiculous comic villains. Now as entertaining as a lot of these villains are, I haven't exactly answered the video's title. Why are these villains so dumb in the first place? One answer would be drugs. Who knows what Marvel and DC were doing behind closed doors, especially during the 70s. I know these companies have publicly condemned substance abuse many, many times, but let's be honest, could a sober mind really have invented animal, vegetable, mineral man? Probably not. My theory, however, is slightly less extreme and also way more believable. Most comic books come out once a month, and so the writer will have one month to finish writing a script. That is, if they're only working on one comic. Back in the 60s, Stan Lee was working on Spider-Man, The Hulk, The Fantastic Four, The X-Men, Thor, Iron Man, Avengers, Daredevil, Ant-Man, to name a few, all at the same time. And yes, there is an argument to be made about how much input the writer really has on the story compared to the artist and who really deserves most of the credit, but the point is, it's a lot of work. One of my favourite shows right now is Smiling Friends. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. The creators don't give a shit if you pirate it. But in one of their interviews, they were talking about how stressful it was to make. How they were mere minutes away from a deadline and they still hadn't finished one of their scripts. And so, in the sheer panic of the moment, they just said, fuck it, we're just gonna put down the most random, nonsensical bullshit and call it a day. And you know what? It turned out to be one of the best jokes in the whole series. The reason I bring this up out of nowhere is because it perfectly highlights the importance of deadlines. When you're under that much pressure, you don't have time to spend ages carefully crafting a masterpiece, or get anxious about what people are going to think. You can't stop to think about whether Stiltman is too silly or if he's not compelling enough, because otherwise you won't be able to pay your rent. Often having too much time can be a setback, because you'll be too busy trying to perfect something and then nothing will get done. Meanwhile, Stan Lee over here has created 20 villains in the same week, and while a lot of them are pretty strong, stupid, there are some that ended up being really special. Because all of these iconic characters, like the Joker and the Green Goblin, all these villains that we celebrate today, started off as these strange, goofy concepts that were just as laughable as someone like Kite Man. The one thing they all have in common is that they all came from someone's purely instinctual and honest desire to create. Because the only way you can make good things is by making bad things, and you can't make bad things if you don't make anything. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. For any casual viewers, that's it. You can click off now, see ya. But for those who've been keeping up with the channel, uh, the message of this video is very personal to me because it directly applies to my own comic. I said a while ago that I'd be rebooting the comics universe I made as a kid, that I'd be taking these wild, childlike concepts and trying to tell a genuinely compelling story that all of you can get invested in, and I've been trying to create these comics for the past three months, and I still haven't got anything solid. Every time I try to draw the first issue, I just think, this is shit, no one's gonna like this, my characterization isn't strong enough, and I start over from scratch. But you can't think like that when you're trying to have fun creating something. So, starting from now, I'm just gonna write whatever comes naturally. I'm gonna give myself a deadline for the end of the year, and if some of it turns out to be a bit shit, then I'll be happy, because I'll still have actually created something that I can learn from and become a better creator because of it. Uh, so yeah, Alexander and Jacob coming January 2023. As always, thank you for watching my video. This was mainly just a filler video until my big Spider-Man project comes out next month. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna go watch The Simpsons.